All right, we got a vulnerability that has something to do with talking to Spy. So the background here is that Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, or UEFI, is a firmware interface specification primarily used on Intel-based platforms. It's used on laptops, desktop servers that have a BIOS, basic input-output system, that implements the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. So your normal boot would have the UEFI BIOS, followed by a bootloader, followed by an operating system. Now UEFI has a specification for how secure booting should work, and the basic idea there is that you verify digital signatures between the phases of boot. So the BIOS verifies the bootloader, the bootloader verifies the operating system, and then it's outside of the scope of UEFI and somehow the operating system should verify drivers and applications and everything else. Also outside of the scope of UEFI is how exactly that UEFI BIOS gets verified. That is left up to the vendors. But Intel specifically has a technology called BootGuard that tries to fix that flaw. And there, the UEFI BIOS is verified by a component called an Intel Authenticated Code Module, which itself is verified by mechanisms built into the CPU. So UEFI BIOS, that may be verified, but it's actually not just one monolithic blob. So frequently we see UEFI divided into phases, the security phase, PEI or pre-EFI initialization, Dixie or driver execution environment, boot device select, transient system load, and runtime. And they've got all sorts of descriptions of all sorts of stuff that happens there. They've got laid out right here that all of this code right here is all to set up the actual UEFI interface that all of this code that runs after can actually use. But if you're interested more in this, you can check out the OST2 Architecture 4021 class. For our purposes, for right now, we just need to know that that Intel Authenticated Code Module verifies this stuff, the security phase and the PI phase. So even though it's called the security phase, it doesn't really actually do anything. And it's really kind of more of a placeholder to say that, well, technically this Intel ACM is part of the security phase. PI phase verifies the subsequent phases, the Dixie phase and BDS phase code. And that code would subsequently verify the bootloader, which I'm showing right here. Um, the notion of transient system load potentially means something differently, but we're just going to say this is going to be the bootloader. Okay, so once you understand how the secure booting system works, then you have to understand a little bit about what lives on a serial peripheral interface or SPI flash chip. This is the non-volatile storage where an Intel firmware is stored these days. So let's say that this is a little chip that's 8 megabytes on your motherboard. The chip would naturally have a bunch of unchanging code that is nice and easy to integrity check, a bunch of naturally changing variables in UEFI called UEFI non-volatile variables that's not easy to check, and then some more code. So the basic breakdown is that usually there's the reset vector towards the end of the chip. That is the place where the CPU notionally executes its very first assembly instruction. Then you've got the Intel Authenticated Code Module blobbed in there. You've got the PEI phase code, the Dixie code, and then usually there's sort of a split between some Dixie phase code on either side of these variables. It doesn't have to be, but uh, that is frequently the case. So then, therefore, in the scope of this picture, how that boot chain works again is Intel CPU verifies the signature and hands off to the Intel Authenticated Code Module. That verifies the initial boot block, which is really just a chunk of the flash that happens to cover the reset vector and happens to cover the PEI code. And that gives you a starting point of integrity verified code from which you can do all the rest of this stuff. So now that that code is integrity verified, you can hand off to that, that will hand off to this, that will hand off to that, and so forth on down the boot chain. Cool, so what's the problem here? Well. When some researchers took a look at what the actual flash access patterns looked like when the system was booting, if you assume the boot time is from left to right, so this is the accesses over time, and the flash addresses go from 0 to high addresses, whatever it is, 8 megabytes, 12, 16. And so this is what the access patterns look like, and the question is, given the fact that we're in the race condition section, can you find the flaw? Well. The original researchers put this circle here, not me. So yes, that is the flaw. This right here, in the context of secure booting and Intel boot guard, this is the initial time of check. This is reading in all of that PEI code so that you can check and integrity verify it. And that would be fetch one. And it looks all clean at that point. But this right here is potential time of reuse. So these are refetching and reusing 
and we know that when you have a double fetch, if there is time in between them, the attacker could have got in here in the middle and changed out the contents between fetch one and fetch two. So everything was clean and good right here, but things could subsequently be acid by the time of the second fetch. And indeed, if you look at uh, some other slides that the researchers provided, you can see this pattern occurs over and over again. Different biases, same pattern. Big linear sweep, which is presumably some sort of integrity verification or reading in a big blob from the spy flash and then other big reaccesses. And same thing here, completely different. You know, you can see that this is a different pattern of access, but you can see that still there's initial sweeps and there's subsequent rereads. So these are time of check, time of use problems. And specifically, these are talk to problems in the context of double fetch. So clearly there's a double fetch going on. And if there is a secure boot system in play, then that of course means there is a check as well. That is the initial integrity verification signature checking. That's the time of check, but later on, because of the double fetch, the time of use could be different. Now I need to be clear, even though this vulnerability was talked about in the context of UEFI and Intel boot guard specifically, this is not just a UEFI or Intel problem. My personal experience from having worked at Apple, where part of my job was to basically run around and take a bunch of small peripheral CPUs like the you know Bluetooth, the GPU, the USB power delivery controller, You've got a bunch of little peripheral processors, each running a firmware off of something like a spy flash. And each of them, if they don't have a secure boot whatsoever, my job was to make sure they had a secure boot so attacker couldn't just trivially win by rewriting the flash contents. But once you get the vendors developers to implement secure boot, more often than not, the first order implementation does have a talk to vulnerability in it because basically the developers are not thinking about the fact that they can't double fetch data from the spy flash because it could be changed out. So, you know, oftentimes this may be an explicit design choice because, uh, you know, maybe their security engineer said, oh, we don't consider spy flash manipulation in scope. And therefore we know that in the context of when the system is first booting, well, there's no other possible way for the attacker to change out the contents of spy flash. But if, like me, you do consider physical spy flash manipulation in scope, then these talk to vulnerabilities always are occurring and they have to be addressed specifically by the programmers making sure that they don't double fetch things. They only fetch once. So how did this uh, vulnerability specifically manifest in the context of this research? Well, if you see this again as time is increasing to the right, then you can imagine that the authenticated code module spends some time verifying the flash. Then it hands off to the reset vector, the sec phase, the initial boot block. That initial boot block loads the PEI core, then now it's running in PEI. That's responsible for loading and initializing RAM because keep in mind that when the system first starts up, it can't actually access any RAM. That is part of the point of the firmware. The firmware is supposed to poke some hardware and turn on the RAM, so initialize the DRAM access. And only after it's initialized can they disable this mode of execution that they're running in right now, which is called cache as RAM or CAR. So all of this stuff got pulled in from the spy flash and executed in the context of cache, CPU cache, that was being treated as if it was RAM, even though it's not like your traditional uh, DRAM, you know, things based on capacitors, it's just cache built into the CPU based on transistors. So anyways, eventually it disables this cache as RAM, and now it's going to load stuff into RAM, and cool, that's fine. But when they looked at all of the double fetches that were occurring, one of them caught their eye, this one at FFCC40, and so looking at that, here's some assembly for what it is, but of course we can't tell you, uh, we can't assume that you know assembly in this class. Of course, as always, you know, that's why we have all of these OST2 classes. So you can go learn assembly at Architecture 1001. You can learn MSRs, which one of those assembly instructions had to do with MSRs. You can learn that in 2001. You can learn MTRRs, that's this thing, in 4001. And you can learn UEFI in 4021. It's almost as if you need to know all sorts of stuff from OST2 classes in order to actually read and understand security research, at least in the firmware space. Anyways, the TLDR of what that assembly was doing is that it clears bit 11 in this particular register. This bit 11 is the EBIT, the manual says of the EBIT. If it is set MTRRs enabled and all MTRRs are disabled when it's clear, 
and the uncached memory type is applied to all physical memory. So basically, if the attacker could change out that code, they could make sure that this MTRR is set to being cleared, uh, the default of being disabled. And if that's the case, then all of a sudden when you're booting through the system, then instead of the code, you know, successfully disabling caches RAM and loading stuff into RAM, the fact that caches RAM has been disabled means that now the code that's running here at this time phase is going to be executing in place. So basically it is fetching assembly instructions from SpyFlash and normally because you have caches RAM, it would just fetch it from the cache. But now all of a sudden those MTRR registers are disabled and it no longer fetches from cache. And now this will all just double fetch and pull assembly code straight off the SpyFlash chip and every single fetch at that point can be feeding back full attacker controlled assembly instructions. So that's the easy way to get code execution is when you can literally just feed the CPU attacker controlled assembly instructions. Cool. So what was the fix? Well, the UEFI platform initialization or PEI spec, which covers how PEI should work, was updated to require that PEI code pulled from the spy flash be copied into caches RAM and then directly into DRAM once it becomes available. That way it won't get double fetched. So here's the, uh, this, I want to be clear, this is a slide from the researchers. I didn't make this slide with all of these compression artifacts. But anyways, the, uh, the slide, the updated PI spec says that the installed firmware volumes, which are basically just big slabs of spy flash that represent uh, a big chunk of the firmware for UEFI systems, those are supposed to be uh, copied into permanent memory. And so the PEI Foundation will copy any installed firmware volumes from the temporary memory location to a permanent memory location, blah, 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 blah. So basically it's supposed to stop the double fetching that could occur afterwards. But in the grand UEFI tradition, this leaves vendors with enough rope to still hang themselves on all of the phases after PEI. So it's like, why do you think that there's only going to be double fetching occurring in the SEC phase or the PEI phase? No, if the vendor is not aware of this type of vulnerability and if the developer is not cognizant of it, then they'll absolutely double fetch something later on, which will allow the attacker an opportunity to fill in acid on the second fetch. So I give this fix a big thumbs down. Yes, it fixes a little point problem, but the bigger problem of double fetches in the context of firmware will still remain.